This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Martin Burke. Martin um, directed and wrote the 1976 underrated horror classic, The Clown Murders which was um, one of John Candy's first leading roles. And um, then he went on to make um, the Peter O'Toole War movie Power Play, um, the uh, low-budget space opera The Last Chase, and um, he also co-wrote the Jim Abrams and Zucker Brothers slapstick comedy classic Top Secret, and he directed... Anthony Quinn's last film, Avenging Angelo, which um, mainly starred Sylvester Stallone. And um, it's going to be a great talk today. I mean, obviously, he's very versatile in genres. And um, he's also, he himself is Canadian, and um, he's done all these different genre films. And it's going to be a great conversation today. And it's the last interview of... Fall September on Splat. And then tomorrow we begin Halloween October. And all of you are just going to be so pleased with the month of October on Splat. Got some great interviews. And this today is going to be a great interview. So yeah, here is my interview with Martin Burke. Hey Martin, welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I am fine, Tommy. How are you? I am spectacular. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward uh, filmmaking and movies early on in your childhood? Well, I gravitated towards storytelling. I mean, I was writing stories when I was 12 years old, and um, I was keeping diaries of stuff, and I was I was kind of living in my head a lot. I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto, right. Canada, and um, I, I I just love stories. And I was blessed by one thing: my parents were British, and they came over to Canada expecting to stay for two, three years, and then go back to Britain. But Britain was in a bit of a mess then, so they stayed, and they were part of the British community up there, which there were a lot of them. Right. And every Saturday afternoon, there was a there was a showing, a screening at the International Cinema in Toronto, and they would show the old Ealing comedies, oh. the old films with with Peter Sellers and Alec Guinness, uh, <laughs> the Lady Killers, the Lavender Hill Mob, and I would go to these things, and it was just magical. I mean, I loved it so. Something in me said maybe that's what you should do but at that time it seemed impossible because i was destined to take over my father's companies he had these little tiny companies that were involved in industrial stuff and uh at some point when you're about 16 or 17 you start figuring out that something's wrong with that plan you know yeah (laughs) do you remember the first movie you ever saw It would be a film that I've never seen played ever after that, a film called Tight Little Island, um, about Prohibition time in Scotland and a little island off the coast of Scotland, and the edict comes down, as I remembered, and I saw it when I was like, God, I don't know, eight years old or something, and the edict comes down that there could be no more alcohol, the evil alcohol was not allowed, and the islanders band together, as I remember, to to create one giant bootlegging operation. <laughs> <laughs> so I I've never seen that film since. And if anybody ever sees it and, and it knows how to watch it, let me know. I'll certainly look it up and uh, let you know. <laughs> um, do you have any uh, favorite movies? Um, on my desk right now, I've got two completely opposite uh, movies, uh, DVDs. I've got one which is Dr. Strangelove, which I have, which is right up there in the Pantheon. And the other is The Dark Knight, which
which to me, mm -hmm. Heath Ledger's performance, his final performance, was a thing of incredible beauty and mystery and creativity. Uh, he, him playing the Joker, I am not a fan of the superhero movies. I never go see them and all that. Yeah. But that to me is in the pantheon. Yeah, beautiful film, beautiful performances, I have to say. And there's a lot of other ones, obviously. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go to some of the classics. I mean, everybody's got The Godfather Part 1 and 2 on their list, which I have on mine. Mm -hmm. But also Lawrence of Arabia, and not just because um, I thought it was an amazing movie well, the last time I saw it and every other time I've seen it, but because I worked with two of the guys in there, O'Toole and Anthony Quinn. And um, just being with them, some of the magic of that film, I guess, rubbed off a little bit. Mm -hmm, absolutely. That's a great movie. So you, you, you played uh, football in high school and at McMaster's University? Yeah, McMaster was the college, or, or the university I went to in Hamilton, Ontario, about 40 miles outside of, of Toronto. And um, it was uh, the usual uh, football and parties and all that stuff. But somewhere in the mix, <clears throat> I was taking French literature, which I barely spoke English, never mind French. And um, I had to read the novel L'Etranger, The Stranger, by Albert Camus. And something in that, and you never know what's going to click with somebody at that age of 20 or whatever I was then. It clicked in me, and I just read it in French. I read it in English. And I, and I loved Camus' arc, his life. I've admired two writers more than a lot of the others. One was Albert Camus, the French writer, uh, World War II, just after World War II, mm -hmm. and he died young in a car crash, um, and George Orwell. They were both men of thought. They were both men of action. They weren't content to simply sit and write. I little, I, I've had little time for the French philosophers who would hang out in the cafes of the left bank in Paris, and that was all they did all their life. Yeah. <laughs> Camus and George Orwell really, really were both involved in wars, they were involved in all kinds of civil insurrection movements, uh, they were they were men of, of action and thought. Yeah, I played football in high school, I was linebacker and O-line and D-line, what position did you play? Linebacker, or middle <laughs> linebacker. <laughs> such so this is one linebacker talking to another. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a fun position, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you get creamed every other play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so after college, you were um, advertising and television programming. Then you were in Vietnam um, covering as a photojournalist? Well, I was posing, let's mm -hmm. say, as a photojournalist. Um, after, after university, I got a job in, of all places, Procter & Gamble in their media and programming department in Toronto, which was actually an amazing job. Um, at the age of whatever it was, 20, I guess, or 21, whatever it was, um, I was kind of the guy who would, be, who, who would fly to all these uh, shows that the company was actually producing. They had uh, they had folk song shows in those days with Simon and Garfunkel and Jose Feliciano and amazing acts. And I, they were put on at all these university campuses all over Canada. I would, I, w I was flying there. Mm -hmm. So they had um, shows with rock music, uh, with rock and roll, and I, w I was in, involved in those. And then that, the other half of my job was flying to New York to meet with the advertising agencies who were going to be placing all the commercials in those shows. So that was a great job for about a year, but corporate life was definitely not for me. <laughs> so I, was, <laughs> I, I, I was not destined for 
higher things in corporate life. So um, I decided that I wanted to go and, and see the most active thing I could think of in those days, which was the war in Vietnam. So I got a press pass from a crusty old newspaper editor who kind of saw me as his younger self, I think, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I sold my car. I moved out of my apartment. I moved back into my parents' house for a couple of months to save money. And I flew over to Vietnam. And um, that was a daily lesson in survival. And it taught me all I needed to know about surviving in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> The analogies uh, were were kind of appropriate because yeah. <laughs> um, in those days, I mean, I, I used to, I, I was actually starving over there because I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. And I, all I could do, it was all I could do to actually pay the hotel bill. And there was no money left over for food. So I used to have to go out into combat because if you were in combat with the troops, you got fed just the same as they did. Yeah. Well, so you were supposedly, or, or I, I was a reporter, quote unquote, and a photojournalist, which I had the camera slung around my neck and I sent back articles um, to the to the Toronto newspaper. And um, I was all over Vietnam in all kinds of combat and uh, flew on a jet fighter and a bombing mission and all sorts of crazy stuff, which... As a, I guess, 21-year-old or whatever I was, mm -hmm. um, I could never have imagined myself doing that a couple of years earlier, and I was thrilled to be doing it. Wow. And that's what the inspiration for your book, Laughing War, was? Yeah. Yeah. Laughing War um, came out of that. I, I saw this hotel I was in called the Catanat Hotel on Tudor Street in Saigon. Mm -hmm. um, it was also the hotel for a talent booking agency of all things. And a couple of guys who, who chomped cigar, old guys who had cigars and pork pie hats, they would bring over these acts from America, these broken down acts. And the acts would stay in this flea-bitten flea hotel that I was in. And uh, the headquarters of this booking agency was in this hotel. And I watched singers and dancers and comedians come over, and they would be ferried out to these big bases. Usually it was reasonably safe where they were going. And uh, they'd be, they would be transported out to, to these bases where they would put on shows for the troops, you know, help the troop morale and all that stuff. Right. And... Um, I I had a couple years after that I was doing a documentary on called Carnivals on a huge huge multi million dollar uh, carnival that had four or five different shows each of them with about forty huge transport trailers that were rumbling up and down the east coast of America and Canada. And this outfit called Amusements of America, quite an interesting outfit. And while I was on this show, they had the rides and the freaks and the clowns and the strippers and all that stuff. While I was on the show, one of these outfits, um, they had a comedian, old time guy. And he would go out there and he would do his kind of song and dance on what was called the ballet, as I, as I remember. The, the front part overlooking the midway and it was come on here come on inside look at these amazing women he he was yeah. the guy who was the guy in the strip show the MC of the strip show and his job was to get people to come inside and then they put on the show he would tell jokes and uh, I got talking to this guy and the more stories about his life and the more what he wanted to do I kind of put those two together and came up with a character, a comedian entertaining the troops in Vietnam. And that's how Laughing War started. It was my first novel, published by Doubleday. And um, had quite a very interesting run, a very, a very tangled run. <laughs> I can say, I'm not sure 
how much to go into that. But it was a very, but that was a great experience for me. And then fr from there, that's when you started making documentaries for CBC? Yeah, I, I, I came back from Vietnam, and um, I quickly got into making documentaries. I, I started as what they called a story editor and then glommed on uh, to to uh, to being a producer. I, I became a producer very quickly. They were a producer-director because... I had a habit of looking for vacuums, and one of the vacuums was a a legendary um, TV anchor guy up there in Canada, and he was going to make this documentary about something or other, but there was one little problem, mm -hmm. lying drunk the whole time he was supposed to be making the film. <laughs> so he shot about, I don't know, a little bit, and when the bosses came in to see it a week ago, before, they were horrified. It had been promoted heavily, and they were in an absolute panic to get something to put on the air in this guy's name. I stepped forward and said, hey, I'll do it. So I, I scrambled 24 hours a day for, for like six days, around the clock. I, I shot a whole bunch of film. In those days, it was all film. Mm -hmm. Shot a whole bunch of film, put it put it all together, and jammed it on the air as if it was done by this guy. And like I said, you look for vacuums, you get interesting things happen. And so that was the first thing I really did, and then they gave me a shot almost because they owed me, and pretty soon I was traveling the world. And it was a great run. I'm forever grateful for it, you know, mm -hmm. all over the world. I could pretty well do whatever I wanted. And I was in a bar one night in Toronto, and I saw a thing saying that there was an earthquake in Peru. I, I'd, I'd wanted to see, um, I wanted to go to South America. So I said to my friends in the bar, guys, I, I got to go. I'm, I'm going to be on a plane to Peru tomorrow. And I was. And we hired a camera crew down there, and we got a very interesting film out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, so it, it was interesting times, to say the least. <laughs> Did you think that documentary filmmaking was going to be your, your life work? No. No. I mean, I, I have never really chosen, and that's part of my uh, strength and weakness at the same time, I guess. Um, I've gone between my three worlds. I have done documentaries, which I truly love. I've been everywhere around all kinds of places around the world, and it's given me an insight into situations people, characters, motivations, uh, in some cases, and uh, the streets of the world. And I've used that for a lot of my novels. I mean, I love writing. I mean, I am a novelist, first and foremost, who sometimes veers off and tells stories either in movies or, or, in, or in documentaries. But the one work... But the worlds, the three worlds, constantly feed into one another, back and forth all the time, and still are right now. I'm I'm involved in a project in Cuba, mm -hmm. and it's come partly because of my other two lives. You know, the storytelling through documentaries and um, and books, and and we're setting up a movie that that will be shot in Cuba right now. Oh, that's awesome. I hope that turns out really well for you. What's the uh, genesis of uh, the clown murders? Oh, <laughs> boy. <laughs> that's going into the attic or uh, going through the archives. The clown murders. There was a program in Canada where uh, you could, where young filmmakers could get a pittance of money to shoot a movie. Um, if you had a script that seemed to work. Well, up in Canada one year, there was a case of a fairly wealthy young socialite, a young woman in her early 20s, who was kidnapped. And she had been out with her equally wealthy uh, friends, male friends, a lot of them, uh, to this kind of party, and then she vanished. 
And there was a huge investigation. She was, her name was well enough known. And it turned out that she was kidnapped by her, her former boyfriend and his friends in what the former boyfriend had convinced the others, his, his friends, was just going to be a prank, a silly, foolish prank that would just last for, for half an hour and it was all going to be over. Well, this guy had other plans. And it wasn't over in half an hour, and it wasn't over in three hours, and it wasn't over by the next morning. And these guys found themselves panic-stricken because they were accomplices in a crime that they never knew was a crime at the beginning. And it had all kinds of psychological dynamics. It had all sorts of weird kind of suspense moments. So I wrote a script on that and got the money to do to do the movie. Um, while we're doing it, it was a lesson. Once again, these things are instructive for so many things. While we were shooting the movie on the very, very first day at lunch hour, I was called over by the producer, an equally young guy named Chris Dalton. And there's a photo of me and Chris standing alone on this polo playing field. Uh, where the movie was being shot, or at least uh, the, one of the big scenes. And somebody wrote in on this photo, they made a poster of it called Why Are We Laughing? And it was quite an apt um, thing to write on that because Chris was telling me on this first morning at lunch hour break that we had no money. The money had not come through, and he was going to have to close the film down. And so we're standing there. We, I didn't know what to do. I just laughed. It was so absurd. And so I, I talked him into keeping shooting for the rest of the day. So, and we kept shooting. The whole time I'm shooting, I'm thinking, this is insane. We're going to be shut down at like 8 o'clock tonight when we finish. Mm -hmm. Between noon and, and uh, the time we finished, somehow Chris got the rest of the money. <laughs> so, and it's, and I've had this happen to me several times while shooting movies. So I think anybody wanting to go in the movie business has to know that this is quite often a possibility. Mm -hmm. Now, during this time in Canada, there wasn't a whole lot of horror films being made other than maybe Bob Clark's Black Christmas and Dead of Night yeah. and uh, David Cronenberg's Shivers. Um, was it a hard sell to get the movie financed? Yeah. yeah, really hard sell because there were not just horror films, and ours was not a horror film. Ours was more uh, yeah. a romance crime uh, movie. There were hardly any movies being made up there at that time. I mean, there was like one and a half crews up there, and and everybody, we were all learning, and we basically pretended we knew what we were doing and somehow got through it. And um, we were always astonished in those days to see a movie made up there that was that was on a marquee of a theater. I mean, it, it, it was quite amazing. I mean, Bob Clark was one of the heroes up there when he did Black Christmas, mm -hmm. and then came down here and did a lot of films down here. Yeah, he, he was a, I think he was from Georgia or from Alabama or something. One of I think uh, Florida. Florida was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know this better than I do. Uh, <laughs> but no, he, he was a good guy. I knew him reasonably well, and I quite like Bob. But yeah, that was quite an unusual thing just to make a movie, period, you know? Of course. Yeah. How many days of filming was it? Oh, I don't remember, but I'm, it, it was it, it was like every, every film I made. Really tight, I would say probably 25 days of filming if we were lucky to get that, you know? Yeah. Fortunately, a lot of it was in a, most of it took place in, in like one or two locations. So we could do it. How, how did you find John Candy? Um, John, I, I always had a rule, and it went back to my days, as I told you, going to the, going to the cinema, as they called it, uh, to see the British Ealing comedies. Mm -hmm. I had a rule, kind of rule, that the, comedy actors were often capable of doing amazing drama. And 
it was very difficult for for a truly dramatic actor to do comedy, but the guys who did comedy could go the other way. So at that time, Second City was really yeah. going strong up in Toronto, and there was John and Dan Aykroyd and Gilda Radner and Martin Short and Eugene Levy and on and on and on. And I would go there on a regular basis because there were friends of mine involved in it, and um, uh, I would say genius up there. In those days, they're really exciting. It was one of the most exciting theatrical things I've seen because the improv uh, part of their shows were really quite ingenious. So I, I had a I, I had a character in this in this clown murders called Ollie. Mm-hmm. And Ollie was jovial and friendly and likable to everybody else, and he kind of got picked on a bit, but he was the guy that everybody loved, and he was going to be the guy that was going to get put through the ringer the worst. And John fit. John just fit. So I can't remember the exact first meeting, but I, we had so many mutual friends. So um, he had never been acting before in anything but uh, skit comedy. So he was thrilled to get the role, and um, he was great. He and I stayed friends uh, right through practically to the end, almost to the end. Um, And we had season tickets to the L.A. Kings hockey games and all the things that Canadians in Los Angeles do. Yeah, my my great uncle um, Michael Shea, who was a, a cinematographer in Hollywood, was a good friend of his, and they both died a year apart from each other, and I never got to meet either one of them, unfortunately. Well, I I had a I had a moment with John, which kind of ended our friendship a bit. I was standing, I, I was quite close to John, and as I said, we'd go to the games together and do all sorts of stuff and we went to baseball games together mm-hmm. and um, I was standing in his kitchen in a big home in Mandeville Canyon part of Los Angeles and his wife was away up in Canada and it was a Friday afternoon and John's staff for the company that he had um, a company something I forget Snowbacks or something um and the staff were bringing in pizzas and ice cream and beer and everything and cigarette cartons of cigarettes because John was going to be there on his own for the next several days. Mm-hmm. He had friends coming in and all this stuff. And this stuff is all cholesterol plus and yeah. as what else. <laughs> and, I, and I looked at it, and John was starting to gain a bit of weight, back, or a lot of weight, actually. Mm-hmm. And I made some joke about all this stuff not being the best health food and all that. And John um, started telling me, yeah, he said, you know, all the men in my family, they all either die or have massive heart attacks about the age of 40, 42. And I was looking at all this garbage food coming in. Yeah. And I said, John, how old are you? And I, I knew the answer, but I wanted him to. He said, I'm 38. I said, well, John, do the math here. You're going to have, it was nothing but pizza and ice cream and french fries and all this stuff. I said, and cigarettes? Yeah. Well, this, I said, don't you think there's a disconnect here? John didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And we, over the last couple years of John's life, there was quite a falling out between John and some of his close friends, like me, who, who really kind of, we're trying to do almost interventions with him. Yeah. And um, he didn't want to hear it, would not hear it. So, and we all know the end of that. So. Right. Oh, God. One of the biggest tragedies ever, yeah. I have to say. But his performance in the movie is, is great. I wish he had done more drama, you know. But once you become, you know, so famous doing comedy, you know, it's really hard to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Hollywood wants to slot you in. I mean, and the actors who try and get out of that have a tough time. There was a, there was a famous thing going way back to the to Steve McQueen, the actor, who who wanted to be known as the classical actor when he was making all these hit movies, and, and he he spent several years trying to do 
Ibsen's Enemy of the People, I think, if I remember correctly, and he was and he was made up to look totally different than the cool, swaggering Steve McQueen, and it yeah. was the film was a colossal flop. Nobody wanted to see him in Hollywood, then slotted him right back into the roles that he had always played, and that was the same with John. I mean, Planes, Trains, and Automobile, and Uncle and Uncle Buck, and all that stuff. That was right down the, on the sweet spot for for John as far as Hollywood's concerned. Yeah. You had some of Canada's finest actors in this movie. You had Al Waxman, Lawrence oh, Dane, yeah. Stephen Young, a lot of great actors. Yeah. Actually, actually, no, you mentioned Al Waxman, who who went on to play a lot of roles in, in things like Law and & Order. And things Cagney and Lacey. Cagney and Lacey, Cagney and Lacey, yeah. Um, uh, he, he was the one that introduced me to John Candy. Yeah, that's how I got to, to John. Nice. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino was a huge fan of the movie. He even brought it up on the Jimmy Kimmel show once. Which movie? Uh, the Clown Murders. You're kidding. No. <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think that, I think that might be on YouTube, as a matter of fact. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, God. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. These films have a life of their own. And I, I mean, I'm always amazed. At people who I, I I was on a book signing tour for my last novel, Music for Love or War, mm -hmm. was in Seattle, in a suburb of Seattle. Right. And there were two people came in with all sorts of heavy looking poster type stuff, and they were not book people at all. And I was sitting there with a bunch of kind of kind of book uh, bookish people, very nice. People, they were asking questions about the novel and on and on. These people couldn't have cared less. As soon as the as soon as the book signing was over, they came roaring up to me, and they they had posters of clown murders. And they had stuff on the, showing John Candy in the film, and they wanted me to sign a ton of clown murder stuff. I'm always amazed at how these things, you know, it's almost like a vampire. You, you have to drive a stake in their heart to kill them, and you can't do that, really. Yeah. Keep coming up. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned before um, about power play. Um, was, 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 that, was that inspired at all by uh, what you saw in Vietnam? Partly. Partly, and um, I, it was really inspired by a little tiny penguin paperback book called Coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. written by a young and very brilliant Washington uh, uh, defense strategist called Edward Ludvak. Edward was born in, in I think, Romania, educated in London, uh, lived all over the world, but he had moved to Washington. He wrote a how-to book, basically, on if you're going to overthrow your local government. I got this little book, probably 120 pages. I read it and thought to myself, of all the stuff I was seeing around the world, this would make a good movie. So I got, I was trying to find Edward. And I couldn't, for some reason, Penguin couldn't find me. He was a kind of mysterious character a little bit. And one day I was passing through London, England. I went to the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation office in London that was my headquarters when I was over there. Mm -hmm. And there was a note on somebody's desk saying, Edward Lutvac called. He had heard that somebody was looking for him. So I got in touch with him, flew to Washington. We talked. I got the rights of the book and created a screenplay on, on it. And um, quickly, uh, it started rolling. And we shot very big scenes. I mean, you talk about learning on the fly. I had only done Clown Murders, which was a $125,000 movie. Um, and now I was over in Germany, um, in Germany, with the Canadian Army NATO tanks rolling through the streets. We had armored personnel carriers, uh, thousands of troops. I was shooting these massive scenes, blocking off entire uh, city areas and, and troops storming the castle and all this stuff. And uh, that, well, let me tell you, <laughs> it, 
that was terrifying. <laughs> I didn't know. I I got through it fine, and the and the footage worked and everything. But then, this being the movie business, mm-hmm. the company we were doing it for lost the financing. So all that amazing footage sat for two years until another company came into it and got a film going all over again. So, I mean, God, in, in the meantime, I, were, I went off and I did a bunch of documentaries and I think I started another book, as I remember. Yeah. How was working with Peter O'Toole? Wonderful. He, he, he was, it was so incredible because I got to him through a fluke. Um, his manager was a guy named Jules Buck and mm. somebody knew somebody who knew somebody, the usual thing. And so Jules Buck said, well, I'm not sure about this, but okay, I'll show it to Peter. And I get a, get a notice to phone this number in London. So I call the number in London and Peter answers the phone and I introduce myself, and I always remember his ringing words as only Peter could say them. I am your man, he said grandly. Everything Peter said was said grandly. <laughs> and um, I said, I guess this is good news. And of course it was. And um, so we put together that cast, which was a fascinating cast. I mean, David Hemmings, who had done Blow Up and a bunch of other things, he was the beautiful young boy of the British actors back in those days. And um, he, he came in, he, he was our British, uh, he was a British co-producer, and we got Donald Pleasance. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, um, I brought a lot of the Brits over for the crew into Canada, and the Brits and the Canadians really melded wonderfully and Peter was just the rock I, I, I owe him so much he was eccentric as hell <laughs> he, was, he was he was quite quirky and sometimes very crotchety yeah. um, odd to deal with in lots of ways if you didn't know what you were doing he would crucify you which thank God I do a lot of homework yeah. and I prepare <laughs> as well as I know how. But Peter, I, I was enormously fond of Peter, you know? Yeah. And um, I owe him a great deal. How, how did Dick Cavett get to be in the movie? Uh, we needed a talk show host, so out of the blue we said, well, who, at, in those days, of course, Dick Cavett was, he was the Jimmy Kimmel, you know? He, yeah. he was the man. And so we just blithely said, oh, let's get Dick Cavett. To our astonishment, Dick Cavett said, sure. So, I, 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 you know, once in a while, in a long while, things just fall into place when you're doing these films. And most of the time, you're rolling the boulder uphill, the myth of Sisyphus. You're rolling the boulder uphill, you get it almost to the top, and it rolls back and crushes you, and you, and you have to go all the way to the bottom and start rolling it back. This film... After we got the financing going the second time, uh, it just worked. You know, I mean, in terms of things that you wouldn't have thought we would have got, like Dick Cavett being one. Yeah, sure, fine, let's do it. So, you know, I I pray I have more of those is all I can tell you. Yeah. (laughs) Then you uh, go into space opera territory with The Last Chase. Um, Was Star Wars an inspiration for this movie? No. No, it wasn't actually. Um, interesting. I I I don't do a dystopian, which this is dystopian. Yeah. Um, I don't do science fiction, which this is not really, but tinges a little bit close to it, a tiny bit. Um, the last chase, a script had been written and was brought to me, and something about it. What I what fascinated me was I thought. It, the script didn't work. The script was really not working at all. Yeah. Something in it appealed to me. These two old guys who were supposed to, one trying to chase the other, one trying to go and, and kill.
kill a catch and kill the other, but it turns out they don't really want the chase to end. The journey is the destination. It, and the metaphor swam over me while I was reading this really awkward script. And it was rewritten. I, I rewrote it, I think, when I don't know if somebody else was involved, but I can't remember. But one of the things, too, was there was a war room type of situation. And as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Strangelove, I love the scenes in the war room with Peter Sellers and with George C. Scott and all that. I thought there was a chance to have some fun and to to emulate uh, that thing that Picasso said mm -hmm. about good artists copy, great artists steal. In this case, I thought we could pretend to be great artists, try to be great artists, and steal like crazy from a war room situation. Uh, and it's not the same type of war room that was in that Dr. Strangelove, it's a different one. But it is definitely has those kind of antecedent or these kind of strands of what was in Dr. Strangelove. And um, it, was a, it was a movie which I, I must say, of all the films I would like to remake, mm -hmm. that is the one I would like to remake right now with the new technology. I mean, we had Burgess Meredith, mm -hmm. the old pilot. And f flying this F-86 fighter jet, a, a kind of a beautiful plane, if you can call fighter jets beautiful, um, from a much earlier era, it was from the 50s or late 60s or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And they were in the hands of private people now. They were in the hands of some very wealthy collectors, owned a few of these. I got a hold of a guy that owned one, and we painted the plane all sorts of wild colors. And there was a scene that called for the old pilot to see the race car driver trying to get to California in this, in this car he's dug up and is racing across America and has to land on the highway right behind the car, scare the hell out of the pilot, or, or, or scare the hell out of the driver who thinks he's about to die, and then just take off right over the head of the car as it's speeding along the road. Well, we did that real. I mean, we didn't have all the technology that you've got now. Mm -hmm. So I got a hold of a highway in Arizona, and we got the this guy who owned the fighter jet flew it, landed on the highway right behind the car at high speeds, and came barreling up to the car and took right off, just skimming the car. And let me tell you, um, shooting that on that day with about as many cameras as I could possibly get, um, that was that was something that we did, I think, as well as we could have. But nowadays, with the technology, oh my God, would we have a field day, you know? Yeah. So that's what I would like to remake. No, you should you know, definitely focus on that in the future. And you know, you talk about films coming back. Yeah. I mean, in the last... Year. I've gotten, I can't tell you how many emails I get and how many, um, and how many weird things I get, like, for instance, magazines over in England, mm -hmm. totally devoted to Lee Majors and The Last Chase. I mean, <laughs> I, it keeps coming back. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm glad it does, and I'm always amazed. <laughs> he was a huge TV star at the time. What made you cast him? Well... Actually, initially, I didn't want Lee Majors. We were going for another Lee, Lee Marvin. Mm -hmm. um, and Lee Marvin couldn't do it, got sick or whatever. And because we had a start date, we had started, we went for Lee Majors because he was the guy we could get. And I was, at the end, I was really glad we did. Lee was a guy, he, he, was, he, he is a good old Kentucky boy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he, he was as dedicated and hardworking and he had talent, which it was very interesting for me directing Lee because Lee had done television all his life. Yep. Television, he had learned how to shorthand things and play things that would get done quickly and all that. Mm -hmm. And I quickly started figuring out 
And he was a way better actor than anybody really gave him credit for. I mean, he was a really good actor. And try to break off the barnacles of television and get him and pushing him the way that a director can very carefully with an actor sometimes. And when I say push, I don't mean that literally. Uh, I was very careful to give him the leeway to do what um, he thought he could do. Yeah. And I would kind of try and raise the bar a little. And he went for it, and he was great. I, I, I was very glad to have him. And, of course, Burgess Meredith was... was he was he was he was having this third or fourth reincarnation of his career because he was the old trainer in Rocky. Yeah. He was Mickey playing in Rocky and he had become a big star all over again in those days. So yeah. it was it was an interesting piece of casting. Yeah, you also uh, had Doug Lennox play the captain. Yes, yes. Oh my god, yes. You know your films. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I know he was the the bad guy in the police academy. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, it, it's interesting to see people that. It, it's interesting to see the arcs up and down of careers, you know. Yeah. And uh, Doug Lennox, yes, you're right. You're right. He was a radio guy. Yes, he was, and I and I can't remember how we got to him. I, I, I mean, a lot of this stuff was part of the jumble of casting in those days, which was very different from now. Right. So how do you get involved with Top Secret? Um, <laughs> uh, I can't, I was, well, okay, it's a convoluted story. I'm going to try and give you the short end of it. Okay. Um, I, w- I was sitting up in Toronto. I just published Laughing War. I get a call from somebody in California who I'd never heard of before, a guy named Ovitz, Mike Ovitz. Oh, yeah. And Mike Ovitz, of course, had created Creative Artists, one of the powerhouse agencies. I didn't know who the hell he was. And he calls me and says, hey, uh, we have a client that would like to buy your book for movies. And I I thought this was some guy operating a bucket shop or, you know, out in the San Fernando Valley or something. I didn't know who Mike Ovitz was. And he wasn't the household name that he became in the industry. Um, so I said, well, you know, I, I want to find out uh, who the client is. I don't know. Have your client contact me. It was one of these kind of things. I sort of brushed it off. So a few days later, I get a call from area code 213, which is Hollywood, Los Angeles, still. And um, so I phoned the number, and it was a Mr. Hoffman. I asked for Mr. Hoffman, and he said, call me Dustin. So... So um, I get flown to Hollywood, Dustin Hoffman, who was a powerhouse in those days. He, he was one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. He could snap his fingers and studios would jump. He wanted to buy this book, Laughing War, which he did, or to option the book, rather, um, have me write the screenplay, fly me to L.A. Me and my wife were flown to L.A. Dustin had them rent a house for me in Malibu, and rent cars for us and on and on it just doesn't happen like that anymore it, it was incredible so okay i'm writing the script for laughing war i finished the script for laughing war and it quickly makes the rounds of hollywood and i start getting offers from all over i get a call from a guy named jeff katzenberg katzenberg who has gone on to be a legend up and down disney but in various ways yep. um katzenberg was then running paramount pictures and he calls me in and to meet him, and he said, I want you to partner in some way writing with these guys who have just had a huge hit film for us, Airplane. And uh, they have all these jokes on their next film, but the jokes don't hang together. I need you to go in and help them write the film. So I... I said to him, hey, it's not what I do, but it sounded interesting, and I'm always up for something I haven't done before. So, okay, Mm -hmm. let's do it. So I met Jerry Zucker, David Zucker, and Jim Abrams, who had just come off this massive hit, Airplane. And and they were the toast of Hollywood, but they were were in 
trouble because they couldn't get this next film going. Right. So we got on, and I ended up sitting in the boardroom of their lawyers in the Brentwood section of Los Angeles. Um, we would all meet every morning, every weekday, and we'd sit around a boardroom table in this huge law firm, and we were writing the script for Top Secret. And it followed a pattern. We would have to wait until David Zucker had organized all the raisins in his raisin bran in a perfect order, and then he started eating his raisin bran. And <laughs> once that was over, then we could start work every morning, and we would start putting jokes together and story together, and we would watch, and we'd be laughing our full heads off. And then every day about four o'clock, we'd tell ourselves what geniuses we were. And we would close up for the day feeling we'd done great stuff. And we'd walk out past the offices of all these puzzled lawyers who were <laughs> looking like we were creatures from a zoo that had escaped. And then every morning we'd start the same. But every morning we'd look at what we had done the day before. And we'd say, that's garbage. Oh, my God, what were we thinking? We were idiots. So we would change it all around and do it again and tell ourselves what geniuses we were, walk out, and the next morning repeat the same thing. Yeah. Somehow, <laughs> somehow we came up with a script uh, that became top secret, which, again, I, I was just reading this thing, the BBC, uh, a couple of years ago, the BBC had a thing about the 100 top comedies of all time. Yeah. <laughs> and there was Top Secret lodged, I don't know what it was, number 56 or 60-something or other, and I just scratched my head and wonder. Uh, I, th I think it's one of the most inventive comedies ever. I mean, to combine Elvis movies with uh, Nazi Germany, it's a <laughs> wild concept, you know? And... <laughs> I think the reason why the movie didn't do well at the box office and it wasn't celebrated at the time was because it came out the same day as Ghostbusters and Gremlins. Yeah, yeah. You know? That was a part of it. But the interesting thing was, and you know, that's interesting. You talk about the box office. Yeah. Um, I, I was at the screening in Westwood, the Westwood section of Los Angeles, with Jerry and Jim and David on the opening night. And, the, and it was a pretty full house, and we thought things were good, but it only made, I forget what it made, six, seven, eight, eight million, whatever it was. Yeah. They were despondent. And like, to me, that was pretty damn good, but they were despondent. They thought it was a huge failure because Airplane had come out and grossed zillions in the first four days or something. But the funny thing is, is that is that top secret is is just keeps on going i know this from the residual checks from the writers guild of america i mean it just keeps on going and going and over the years it's the one that people want to talk about you know yeah it, it's it, it's it's weird how some films um jerry zucker had another movie that was quite similar in a way, he, he, did, he did that movie called Ghost with right. Swayze and Demi Moore, I think it was, yeah, and, yeah. and, and Whoopi Goldberg. And Ghost came out at a very flat opening weekend, but it held steady and climbed a little bit week after week after week after week and became a gigantic hit. So, you know, Hollywood lives or dies, it seems, by the opening weekend. Yeah. <laughs> At least it did in those days. Yeah, and I, and you know I I know people who saw the Val Kilmer documentary recently, and they oh, were. I saw that. Oh my god. Yeah, th they were disappointed that um, Top Secret wasn't talked about enough in that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have the feeling um, he would rather be remembered as Maverick or something, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, for, for Top Gun than than the character in Top Secret. That was really his first really starring role, you know? Yeah. And and I remember Val Kilmer shows up. Uh, there was a party that Jerry Zucker and David Zucker threw at the house they shared mm -hmm. uh, just before the filming started. And Val Kilmer shows up, and at that time he was dating Cher, mm -hmm. and uh, they're at the house, and Val Kilmer looked like a deer in the headlights the whole time. He really didn't know what was what. <laughs> 
pain, and I'm just being interrupted here by this thing called a cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I couldn't get through like 20 minutes of that documentary. I was just devastated at, at him, you know, talking with the voice oh, box and all of that. Man. man, I found it very hard to watch, you know. And I, I remember, though, I, they had a thing about... I had a thing in that film about the island of Dr. Moreau or whatever it was. Oh, yeah. The film that Val Kilmer made with Marlon Brando. Yeah. And I had a bizarre connection. I mean, so tangential as, as to be ridiculous. But um, I was at a premiere of a Toronto Film Festival, uh, the party for a film called The Burning Season with Raul Julia. Oh, yeah. And somehow... I ended up in a far distant part of the restaurant talking to John Frankenheimer, the director. Mm -hmm. And um, Frankenheimer, who directed The Island of Dr. Moreau, right. was just despondent and ranting about Val Kilmer as being the, the devil spawn. He was ranting about what a horrendous thing terrible human being he was and I sat there and I, I'd never met Frank and I before mm -hmm. I might as well have been a piece of wood I just sat there listening and he was talking to me like he was just almost about to have a nervous breakdown and I and it was interesting to see Val Kilmer talking about how he was on that movie and it, it, it apparently not very good so uh, anyway that's a tangent sorry to go off on that tangent but that's okay. this is full of them <laughs> I uh, as I mentioned to you in email, you know, I talked to Kathy Quinn about Aven Avenging Angelo, and I was curious to know, I mean, was uh, was, An was Anthony um, the, always the first choice for that role? Oh, yeah, that to me is one of the stories in my life I will remember forever. I mean, he was the first choice, and he was sick at the time. I was under great pressure not to cast him. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I really wanted him. And so at the time, just a sec, sorry, I had to close the door there. Um, at the time I met him mm -hmm. in, in the Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto, it was as if we'd known each other all our lives. There was some bizarre bond. And, and I don't have this happen very often or, or at all. Um, and we just bonded. And part of it was because Anthony had a friend named Frank Costello. Right. Frank Costello was the model for Don Corleone in The Godfather, the Marlon Brando character. Frank Costello was a New York mobster, very classy, would not go into drugs, would not do the violent stuff the other guys do. And a guy named Carmen Galenti hated, hated Frank Costello and was always trying to harm him. Well, he never got to him. But when Frank Costello died, there was a mausoleum with big brass doors, and Galenti got to that and had the doors blown up. So this is a weird, weird tangent. Anthony Quinn venerated Frank Costello in some weird way as almost a father figure. When I was doing a documentary, I had got to Carmen Galenti, the, the mob guy that was attacking Frank Costello, and I had got uh, all kinds of uh, surveillance footage on Galenti. I did things that were really not in Galenti's favor mm -hmm. through this documentary. Anthony Quinn loved the story that I told him about this. It was as if I had done something for a man that he had loved. And I became so close to Anthony Quinn in weird, weird ways, like I said. I mean, we were shooting a scene, a final scene, where I noticed he had a lot of lines. And I noticed him sitting in the corner of this old warehouse where we were shooting and the crew all bustling back and forth and he was on his own, I could see he was nervous. I went over to him and said, 
Tony, you're nervous. Yeah. He said, so? I said, <laughs> you're, the dumb, you're the dumbest guy in this room. He glared at me. What are you talking about? I said, you're nervous with your career, with your life? Think about the rest of us working with you, trying to live up to what you do. You know, we should be nervous, not you. You're really dumb. He just glared at me, swore at me in some way. He immediately <laughs> called action, and he was fabulous. And afterwards, he laughed at me, and we thanked each other. But he said something to me. One time we were together, and, and Anthony Quinn says to me, he was pointing to his arms and his hands and his shoulders, and he waved one hand over the other arm and shoulder. He said, you see this? All this will be gone soon. Sometime soon, this will be gone. And I said to him, what are you talking about? He said, just listen. It will be gone, but you will see me in the clouds, in the blue sky, in the green hills and the, and the huge trees. You will see me there. I thought, okay, I know he's got a bit of a mystical side to him. I know he's got Indian blood and all sorts of interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't, I said, okay. And then we went on to something else. Well, so Anthony Quinn dies. Um, about, this was about four or five months later he died. I'm in Sicily. I get a call from his widow, Kathy. I, I didn't know he died. And she said, he's written you the last letter that he ever wrote. And he wanted, he wrote it on the afternoon he died and he wanted you to have it. So I got the letter and it was more of this mystical stuff, which I've kept in a very private place. But there was something about it that, that it was like it wasn't finished. So, and I still didn't understand it all. So about a year later, I get a call from either the family or Columbia Pictures or something. Columbia Pictures is going to dedicate one of their brand new screening theaters, beautiful screening theater, to Anthony Quinn. They're going to call it the Anthony Quinn Theater at Columbia Pictures, now the Sony lot here in, here in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know, would I make the dedication speech? I said, wow, okay, you know, I will if you want. So, okay, fine. So on the night, there's a whole bunch of the of the film people are there. They're all there, and I go into this beautiful, beautiful theater. And I walk down the front with, with, with the little speech I'm going to make, I stand at the lectern and I suddenly go absolutely blank. I'm staring, it's a curved ceiling, a kind of Quonset hut ceiling, and it's got murals of everything he told me I would see. The green hills, the blue sky, you will see me in the trees, you will see me in the flowing rivers. They're all there in this mural. And I stood there, I could barely talk. I said, I said to my, Anthony, don't do this to me right now. <laughs> it was one of those moments, and I, I, I could almost hear him chuckling, you know? Yeah. But it was, it, it was an amazing, it was an amazing encounter, and I, he was one of the people who, like I said, you meet one or two people in your life, and you feel you've known them all your life, you know? Oh, absolutely. We all have those kind of moments with, uh, certain people. So, um, you mentioned before about that movie that uh, you're hoping to make uh, in Cuba. Are there any other projects that um, you're uh, working on? Yeah, actually, I, I have just finished a novel that I'm still tinkering with the end of it. Um, it takes place, uh, it's about a young woman working for a newspaper in Berlin in the wild days of the 1920s which turn into the deadly days of the 1930s. So I'm, so I'm at the tail end of that. Uh, the film I've just got through meetings with all the all the all, all the business end of the up here for the financing. Uh, we're hoping to be shooting that next spring. 
but of course we are waiting to find out if the country opens up because of COVID. Right. A lot of problems there. And there's a series which I have written and we're waiting to start that too. But things are kind of like planes over LaGuardia right now. They're all stacked up and circling. So, you know, in a few months I'll be able to give you more clarity. But right now it's the usual jumble. Well, that's great that you're staying busy. And I thank you so much for coming on today, Martin. This was a yeah, lot of fun. Funny. My pleasure, sir. You have yourself a great day, and please stay safe. Okay, same to you, and thanks a lot. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Martin Burke. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy. And he's done a lot of great work, and he's going to continue doing a lot of great work. I'm so honored I got to talk to him. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes.